and welcome to Roadmap 2019 here on Channels Television. On this program, we interact with major stakeholders in Nigeria's journey to the general elections of next year. I am Ladi Akiri Doluale. Thanks for joining us. Now that INEC has lifted the ban on open campaigns, my guest on this edition says political actors and institutions must put national interest above all else and play the game by the rules. My guest also says there are many challenges to tackle, as evidenced by the rancorous party primaries that produced the candidates. Now please join us as we talk to a veteran election observer and the executive director of the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, Mr. Clement Wankwo. It's a pleasure having you with us. Welcome to Roadmap 2019. Thank you, Ladi. Now, uh, as someone who participated in quite a few battles uh, in the run-up to the Fourth Republic, and uh, you've been present since then, do you think 20 years, or odd years, that is, down the road, are we on the right path towards sustainable democracy? And by that, what I mean is, are we putting up the institutions that would ensure that this time the democracy lasts longer than it had lasted in the past, especially coming from the angle of the electoral process? It's a mixed basket. Uh, certainly the fact that we have had uninterrupted civilian rule since 1999 is a major progress, and I think the country uh, should be quite delighted at that. Um, there are challenges, there have been challenges, uh, a lot of it dealing with building institutions. And the cliche is there that it is better to have uh, strong institutions that are working than to have a strong man. The strong man is the dictator. The institutions is what makes the country, what makes a process go smoothly, such that it doesn't matter who is there. And it shouldn't matter who is president. Once the institutions are running, once people know what they're supposed to do, once people understand that the institutions exist to serve them and to deliver on their expectations, then society would go very smoothly. And advanced democracies, institutions have been built, they have thrived. It doesn't matter who is prime minister, it doesn't matter who is president, the institutions, the system has a way of filtering out what is wrong and allowing the good things to happen. Uh, with respect to Nigeria, I think we have, like I said, the uh, good luck of having uh, had uninterrupted civilian rule for close to 20 years, uh, but we haven't. We haven't succeeded in building in as strong a manner as we should, institutions that will enable us to say that this is an irreversible democratic practice that we're involved in. And I think that's the big worry that people have, that the strong man is still able to manipulate the institutions and get institutions to serve them rather than serve the people. Okay. Now, um, along those lines, one very important element, and I note the fact that you use the word civilian rule as opposed to democracy. Uh, because I've spoken to a few other people who have said there's a difference, I mean, very big difference between both. Now, if we take it that we've had civilian rule, um, one of the things that may be the difference between civilian rule and democracy is the electoral process, the yes. process by which the leaders emerge. How has that fared? I think we had an electoral process that was closely at the beginning guided, teleguided you would even say, by the outgoing military government. You continued, or Nigeria continued along that path up till 2007 when it had one of its worst elections in history. And then people paused, people said, what is it we're doing? Why can't we get it right? And the outcry, even the president who was elected in 2007, came up and said, I know that the process that threw me off as president was flawed. So he created an electoral reform committee that was headed by Justice Mohammed Ways. And that committee had a thorough review of the electoral process and came up with suggestions on how to improve it. 
some of the proposals, some of the suggestions by that committee have not been implemented. But we have seen since then a trajectory with the electoral process that you would describe as positive. We're not there yet. Perhaps even we're far cry from getting there. But certainly, we haven't regressed since 2007. But in terms of getting there, do we have, for instance, the major basis for an election is your voters register. Do we have a voters register that we can all say proudly has no integrity issues? I would not say I agree with that. I would say that if you need an electron, a voters register, that is automatic. In advanced democracies, you don't have to have registration of voters. What you have is registration of bets and debts, which the National Population Commission manages. Now, if you have that system of record keeping, of knowing who your citizens are, then you can automatically extricate from that the voting population, which is anybody above 18 years. Then you will automatically issue them a voters register. Then because the law operates very well and people respect it, you would know that when someone dies, it must be entered into the register. It's a law, it's compulsory, it's actually an offense not to register a debt. Once you begin to implement all of that, then you don't need all the resources you spend going through all the process of registering voters. So we need to sort that out as a first issue. The second issue then becomes the voting process itself. How is it organized? How are the parties functioning? Are the parties functioning right? You know today we have 91 political parties. No country runs an election with 91 political parties on the ballot. There must be a criteria for people to qualify to be on the ballot. Yes, you can have 1,000 political parties, but not 1,000 parties should be on the ballot. So you must create criteria that parties qualify to be on the ballot. That way you can manage even the ballot paper itself. Now we don't know whether INEC is going to print a booklet or several sheets of ballot papers. So you have to get the parties right. You also have to get the parties to understand the need and importance of internal democracy. Now you look at the primaries that were conducted by the political parties recently. It's a sham. None of the parties complied with the laws of the land in terms of how they should manage primaries. primaries. The Electoral Act is quite clear. You either have direct primaries or indirect primaries. Direct primaries means that every member of the party votes. Now, there is no one party in this country that can claim credibly that it knows who its members are. They don't have a voter's register. They don't have a membership register. So the whole idea that somebody won direct primaries with X million of votes is completely wrong. It, It cannot be true because no party has a member's register. So it's impossible to determine who even is a member of the party or who is entitled to come and vote or even the process of conducting it. Because when you saw some of the people who conducted the right primaries, whether it is with the legislative elections or the presidential elections uh, primaries, the numbers were being counted in ways that you know you would make children in nursery and primary school wonder whether they know how to count their alphabet, uh, their, their numerals. So you would see someone count one, two, two hundred, three hundred, one thousand, two thousand. You, you, you really shouldn't have those kinds of sham play out. And then in the indirect primaries, you basically had governors seize control of the process. In some states, governors were saying, everybody who has bought form, step down. This is what we want. So all of that means that you have a situation where parties themselves are not respecting their internal processes. Coming to INEC, INEC still has issues. Yes, a lot has happened. A lot of credibility has been built, a lot of processes, and we saw that. uh, We've participated with INEC to try to build the internal processes and create, uh, they have created guidelines, they have created rules, 
they have tried to set out election plans and from what we see today it's been a major milestone the way the electoral commission has come and yes they are very good people in INEC and, and we work with them and we support them and we believe that there's a whole lot of good intentions within INEC but there are still officials in INEC who cannot get away from being subjects of compromise and those are things that we need to deal with going towards the elections we need to see the electoral commission much more nonpartisan, much more objective in the way that it wants to deliver on elections going beyond INEC to the security services for me talking about 2019 it's a whole big subject but the nonpartisanship of the security services the police the DSS is going to be the defining factor for the 2019 elections and if we are to take the last elections that INEC, the last major elections that INEC conducted in Oshun State, and the Oshun State, we often make the distinction between what we call Oshun 1, which everybody was pleased with, and Oshun 2. Oshun 2, for me, was one of the worst examples of how police and security should not be involved in an election. It was extreme partisanship, extreme collaboration, with one of the parties. So if you are to have that as the mindset of security services going into 2019, then I can assure you that there will be no election that will be described as legitimate 